Hello there and welcome to On Track. I'm Rob McGregor and this is the first of our uh, new series, um, a monthly update of where markets are at, what it means to you, uh, which we've called On Track. Um, and the idea of everything that we do is to keep you on track with hitting your financial goals. So it's it's 15th of March as I record this, I'm recording it for market updates to the end of February 2019. And a little little word first on why we're producing this. So we're producing this for our clients, um, yeah, and it's to keep you informed and up to date. Uh, for those of you that are interested in what's going on in the world, what's going on in the markets, um, it gives you our view. Um, it provides you with consistent commentary. And what I mean by that is commentary that's consistent with your plan and your long-term objectives. Too often, uh, the media is very short-term focused and the stuff that comes out of there is completely unhelpful and often misleading and doesn't help people make good long-term decisions. And I'll talk about that um, yeah, coming up at, towards the end of this session. Um, we wanna reinforce um, perspective. So whatever's happening in the world, perspective means just what does that mean to you? What does it mean for your plans to put it into context? Um, to reinforce the good principles that your plans and your investment portfolios are built upon and to help you make good decisions and avoid the bad ones. And ultimately that's a big part of what we do uh, to keep you on track for your goals. Um, first a warning, one, this is intended for clients of McGregor Wealth Management who have um, long-term plans, long-term investment portfolios around our care uh, methodology and investment philosophy. Uh, it's not intended for anyone else. For anyone else who's watching this, um, feel free to watch it. You'll get an idea of some of our beliefs and values. And please feel free to reach out if you're looking for advice. So this is general advice only, so and no guarantees um, about, we put together the information with the best of our ability. Um, yeah, but yeah, you can read that. Um, Yes, seek out advice, wait for your reviews, talk to us. If it prompts any questions, please yell out. So what we're gonna cover in these updates, we're gonna look at important market news um, and stuff that's really important and really to help you navigate through the other news and the noise that comes through all that. We're gonna put it into context about our market framework and our investment framework. Gonna give you an update on key market sectors like Aussie shares, US shares, international shares, and, and property markets. Uh, we're gonna put it all into perspective. What does that mean to you? We're gonna talk about some of the behavioral dangers. So behavior is the biggest risk to most investors out there. Um, and I'm gonna update this to show what people are doing at the moment that are creating um, losses for them while the people like yourselves with calm heads um, hang on and, and, and achieve the goals and the results that you, you planned. And we're gonna also remind ourselves of some lessons from history and so that we can learn, continue to learn from those. So in first, firstly, the news in terms of um, both Australia and internationally, share markets continued their rebound. And I'll look at that in more detail for each market, but we're just about back from where we were at the, um, prior to the downturn that was pretty much from September through to December. In Australia, we have the increased likelihood of a rate cut. Rates have been on hold for a long time. Um, most economists are now starting to think the next move, if any, may be a cut or two, which tells you that we're not growing that strongly. Um, we've got a lot of pre-election uncertainty. Um, yeah, the, the government's announced the budget will be brought forward to April the 2nd. Um, that's early. That will allow them to, to start, uh, to announce the election which will be in May, most likely. Um, economic figures, we've, we've slowed down to a 2.3% growth rate. So it's a below average um, growth rate. It's not terribly low, but the December quarter was about 0.1%, which is low. Um, and remember the definition of a recession would be two negative quarters of growth. We haven't had any negative quarters, um, but certainly slowing down. That's prompting the likelihood of an interest rate cut. The slowdown is largely driven off um, you know, a couple of big factors, continued drought in much of rural Australia, housing slowdown, and lower housing prices also has a wealth effect and means people aren't as confident in their spending. We all feel richer when our houses are going up in value. Um, some of the positives though, the good side of the economy, um, we've got strong infrastructure spending. We're seeing that around most parts of Australia. Um, and this is a good thing. And, and we're likely to have more government stimulus come out of the upcoming budget. Uh, that budget, by the way, is likely to be a phantom budget. In other words, the government may not get a chance to implement anything that they promise. 
because they may not be in power. Um, it'll be a pre-election um, promise, uh, and it's likely to contain a lot of government stimulus. Now, that's a good thing when private, private spending and private investment slows down. Uh, it's great when governments can take over and stimulate the economy, which then flows through and leads to recoveries in those sectors as well. Um, we've had a mining recovery, and yeah, if you look at three big sectors for Australia, mining, um, infrastructure and housing, they're often out of whack. You know, when we had a mining boom, um, we weren't doing that much infrastructure. Housing was certainly booming. As the mining slowed down, the housing boom took over and infrastructure also helped. So that helps keep our economy growing even when some sectors aren't. International markets, we also saw share markets rebound. Uh, still a cloud over Brexit, still no solution. It's becoming a bit of a circus. Um, it doesn't have any real impact on your portfolios. It's very interesting and there's lots of people trying to work out exactly what's going to happen. It doesn't matter if, unless you're a speculator and trying to trade off short-term market movements, which we certainly aren't. Um, all the news is factored into the markets. Britain's got some pain to go through. Um, they're not looking very clever collectively at the moment, but it will get worked out like all these things. So we'll look back and wonder what all the fuss was about. Um, probably one of the biggest impacts on the markets and certainly the downturn from September through to, to Christmas was partly driven by US-China um, trade wars and the recovery as, as, as came about as the likelihood of those being resolved um, started, to, the market started to feel like that was a likely outcome. The, the, this is driven by the fact there's a US election in 2020 and Trump is likely to want to go into that with the trade deal done with China, which will make markets happy and likely to lead to strong US share markets. And Trump likes that. He knows that he'll take credit for that, um, rightly or wrongly. Um, the US Fed, so that's the one, that US Fed is the um, same as our Reserve Bank or similar, and they um, regulate monetary policy in the US. Um, indications are they become more dovish. That means they're less likely to, to rate rise rates as much as the markets thought based on their last announcements. This also contributed to that market comeback. Um, it's kind of good news is bad news and bad news is good news. In other words, if the economy is growing too strong, the market starts to get worried. And if they're getting worried about rate hikes, they start to get worried that that might get overdone and lead to a recession. And that's why we had the downturn. Um, yeah, well, that's roughly why we had the downturn September to December, along with those trade war fears. The US growth is slowing. It's still very good, um, better than Australia, and it's slowed back from very, very good. Um, so one commentator called this from great to good, and it's back to its long-term trend. Um, yeah, and the US economy is looking okay, which is good for world growth as well. China, which was also, um, yeah, also cutting its, 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 sorry, it was increasing its rates, it switched back to stimulus. And it's also spending money, which is likely to lead to you know, continued good growth for China. China grows at about twice the rate of, of the US, um, and it helps world economies, particularly economies like Australia, grow. So stronger growth in China will certainly help the Australian market. So all in all, um, yeah, the world's growing slowly, enough that companies can make decent profits, not enough that we're heading into any boom. And it doesn't look like we're, we've got any recession, although some economists think there's a, a slight likelihood of a recession. Once again, the market is not the economy and the economy is not the market. So a recession doesn't mean a major stock market crash. Many recessions come without much stock market movement or the stock market anticipates it before it happens. Um, it's only when markets are in a major boom and the recession follows that we're likely to see a big downturn. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So let's look at that market context. And many of you will be familiar with that hand-drawn um, whiteboard um, in the red writing on this slide, where we talk about the market going through three cycles, three parts of the cycle, the boom, which is the FOMO or the fear of missing out, and the bust, which is the fear. One of my clients quite rightly pointed out that FOMO, the first letter is fear. So we've got fear and fear. In a boom, we're, we're we're scared of, of getting lesser return than our, than our friends and our neighbours. And in a bust, we're just scared of losing all our money. And then we get, end up in the third stage, which is wall of worry. And that's where we actually are in markets most of the time. The market's always worried about stuff. And it's always worried about another whatever happened before. So in this case, another GFC. Post the Great Depression, they're worried about another depression. 
you know, post stagflation in the 70s, they were worried about another reversion to stagflation. So the market is said to climb a wall of worry as it does. You'll see the index chart, that common cycle of boom, bust, boring. Um, booms followed by bust, followed by boring or the wall of worry, which is the boring where it creeps up, comes back again. And I'll talk about some of the cycles within that in a minute. You'll see this bottom chart, which is just the all ordinaries index, uh, just the price. So the index chart has dividends reinvested. So this is without the dividends. And this goes back to um, yeah, late 80s, and it shows it going from under 2000 to where it is at the moment, about six, actually this chart's a couple of months old. So this was at the bottom of the market, which I used for an article around then. But even now with the market back around 6.3, you know, someone who invested back in the late 80s has done incredibly well. They've tripled their money and they've had a dividend that whole period of four to five percent plus the franking credits. Um, yeah, but we can see quite clearly here that boom, you know, through 2004 to 2008, when markets were returning about 20 percent per annum in that last five years plus. So that was a good indication that markets were running too hard. And then the, the, the bust is just a logical correction to that boom where the market's got ahead of itself. If we drew a line you know, from the start of that boom straight through to where that we finished post the bust, it would be pretty boring. But markets are emotional creatures. They get a bit too excited, then they get a bit too scared and they come back to gravity. But in the long run, they go up and they deliver. Um, they deliver nice returns to us. So our aim is to avoid too much damage. And most of that damage is done during a boom, particularly the late stages where people borrow too much, they under diversify, they double down on high growth sectors like tech during the tech boom, um, etc. And then they make mistakes where they panic and get out of their stuff. There is only three ways people lose money in the share market. One is if they panic and sell when markets are down. The other is if they have to sell when markets are down. And the other is if they're not truly diversified. Um, and we make sure you do none of those things. So we, we being the GPS Investment Committee, puts an assessment on the market, on each of the markets each month, and we classify them as one of those five classifications, from FOMO to Wall of Worry Expensive, to Wall of Worry Fair, to Wall of Worry Cheap, and to Fear. Um, and that helps us put context around decisions about your portfolio, and I'll talk more about that as we go through each of the markets. Um, so let's now get into the update, but first, actually a bit of a lesson from history um, and the catchphrase there, the ups are permanent, the downs are temporary. So in Australia since 1900, there's been 35 times the markets dropped more than 10%. So 10% was the drop we had from September through to December. And it's pretty normal, once in every three and a half years. So more frequent than a US election, more frequent than Olympic games. So it's gonna come around, it's not the same cycle sometimes it's every two years sometimes it might be six years and it's totally unpredictable um, it can be more likely at certain times when the market gets ahead of itself we can never tell exact what like, what's going to trigger that bit of worry that brings it back now we're not really worried about 10 percent corrections because we know in the long run they're not big enough to scare most people particularly um, people with long-term plans like yourselves we're worried about the big ones. And on the right here, those boxes with the red dots are the eight worst downturns in the Australian share market since 1900. So there's only been eight times we've had drops of more than 21%. So, and they're the ones that we're not scared of, but we're wary about because that's where damage can be done. So we analyze what the market conditions were like in the lead up to that downturn. And once again, the bust comes before the, sorry, the boom comes before the bust not the other way around. So if you look at in each of those cases, in each of those years where the market peaked and then subsequently dropped by more than 20%, the returns in the lead up to that, and have a look at the columns five, seven, and 10 years. In every case, one or more of those is greater than 15%, particularly when you add on 4% dividend, because those numbers don't include dividends because they're based just on the All Ordinaries Index, which without the dividend included. So in 2007, for instance, the five-year return was, was nearly 25, 26%. So no wonder the market got ahead of itself and no wonder it had a pullback in perfect hindsight. Now, not every time the market goes up a lot will it come down. Sometimes the market will keep going up, sometimes they'll go sideways. So we never just get out of markets in those times. But it's time to be aware, time to make sure we've topped up your reserves, time to make sure we're on standby in the active portfolio. Um, and that's what we're doing constantly. 
So let's have a look at each sector now. So Aussie shares, and from left to right, we've got long-term historical returns adjusted for today's inflation rate of around 2.5%, around 9.5%. Um, and that's before any fees or taxes or management fees. Um, Tenure returns, interestingly enough, about 11.4%. So very strong, not overly strong, certainly not into that 15% to 20% bracket where trouble might lay ahead. And it's a bit of a false statistic, the 10-year return here, because if you look at this 10-year chart down the bottom right, we're actually almost bang on the anniversary of the bottom of the market following the GFC. So we're measuring from the bottom of the market to where we are today. And don't forget the market actually peaked at 6,600 just a year before that, or not quite a year, about eight months before that. So if you're measuring the 11-year performance at the moment, it would be a very low six or 7%. So be very careful about statistics and what you compare them to. Um, and what you'll see in the next few months is, you know, if you recall, the market rebounded strongly from the bottom in the GFC, and it bounced 50% in that first little while. And that meant, means that as we look into returns, the 10-year returns over the next little while, it'll actually drop because the, the base will move up unless we have you know, strong gains. In the last year, as we move across, we've got five-year returns about 7.29%, three-year about 12.8%, one year at 6.81%. And what you'll see as you watch these episodes in coming months is that the monthly changes a lot and that affects the yearly which affects the three and the five year what we're interested in is the long term returns yeah and that target of, of getting from, from yeah in a low return decade of seeing shares probably get seven to nine percent returns over the long run our assessment on the Aussie share market at the moment is fair value so that means neither expensive nor cheap um, it can be a good time to buy or a good time to sell but it won't be the best time to buy or the best time to sell so where we've got time, we may wait for better times to sell. Um, for our dollar cost averages, you know, all that volatility is, is a wonderful thing. And for our retirees that have their reserves, uh, they don't have to sell when markets are down, but they can sell when markets recover where they need to. US shares, now really interesting here, the long-term historical return there about 10%. The seven year return's pretty high, but once again from a very low base. And a lot of that for us Aussies is currency because our Aussie dollar has dropped. So over that period of time, that bottom chart, which is about an eight year chart, the blue line there shows that 40% of that total 200% return is currency. So roughly one fifth. So if you took that off the 20%, you'd be down around 15%. So you'll see that all around 15% at the moment, but a fair chunk of that is currency. In the last year, we've had a 15% in US share markets, but it's pretty much all currency. So that top right chart shows that the currency, the US, the blue line, has a 12% return and US shares without dividends, about 11%. So adding dividends and the timing's not exactly matched on that one. Uh, but yeah, most of that one year return in US shares has come from the Aussie dollar falling. So this is one of the reasons we love diversification because we get multiple benefits from different markets at different times. So at the moment that counterweighs the Aussie shares slow growth um, perfectly. Our assessment on this market is still fair value. So even though we were showing reasonably high returns, given if we're looking at the US returns in their own currency, they're a bit lower. And, and company profits in the US uh, have been rising strongly to support valuations there. And keep in mind, in a low interest rate world, we can support higher growth rates. Um, because the comparison, the alternative to investing in the share market in the States is, is 1%, one and a half percent interest rates. US small caps, which plays an important part in both your core portfolios and the active portfolios. Um, yeah, consistent high returns. Historically, small caps perform better than large caps, but with more volatility. That's why we have a smaller proportion of them in the diversified portfolios. Um, and you'll see once again the currency, the blue line, makes up a fair chunk of the returns. Um, our current assessment of, of the small cap market is, is fair to, to expensive. doesn't mean we sell, um, but if they get very expensive in our active portfolios, we certainly go and watch, and that's something we did. We exited US small caps in the active portfolios um, around about October, and we've only just got back into those markets as we view them now at fair value. And keep in mind, we're never trying to predict markets. We're just trying to um, take some profits off the table, particularly in the active portfolios where the markets get ahead of themselves. 
So let's have a look at global leaders. This is the top 100 companies in the world. So it takes in more than just US companies, uh, but global leaders from all around the world. Long-term historical return adjusted for inflation about 10%. The one-year return is closer to Australian share market returns. Uh, and that's partly because there's not as much currency effect. What we've seen in the last year in particular is a very strong US dollar. So that's made US shares look much stronger to everyone else, even though they're flat in the US themselves. Um, Five-year returns, three-year returns, healthy, and global leaders have been a great performer in all of our portfolios. Um, and they sit in the active portfolio. Emerging markets, which sits in the core and the active portfolios, is the one that's copped the most pain from the, the trade wars, US-China in particular. So that hurts emerging markets like China, India, uh, on fears of uh, less, less opportunities for those countries as, as trade barriers are put up. Um, that will mean when those things are resolved, we'll see strong rebounds. And emerging markets um, generally will give a higher return than developed markets but with much more volatility, which is why we only have a small amount of them relative to the large um, developed country share markets. We view the, the um, emerging market area as cheap. So that means um, yeah, where the, the portfolios get out of balance, we'll be topping up those emerging markets back to their benchmark allocations. And let's have a look at residential property now. Lots of, it's a hot topic, particularly in Melbourne and Sydney. And keep in mind, most of the press is based in Melbourne or Sydney. So they're very gloomy about property because their own houses are down. It's less of an issue in, in cities like Brisbane, Adelaide and Hobart. Um, and we've seen some strong growth in some of those cities. And certainly here on the Sunshine Coast where I'm recording this, um, yeah, we've had good growth uh, as well, or reasonable growth, I should say. Low, low single figures, but still, growth compared to the almost 10% declines for the last year to the end of um, to the end of December of these um, figures um, from domain real estate and yeah they, they show what is a correction in the Sydney and Melbourne markets pretty natural correction those markets were both running up very strongly and if we want to get a bit of long-term perspective here that overlay I've just put up is the 2003 median prices and Look how much Melbourne and Sydney prices have increased over the last 15 years. So it's no wonder they're taking a bit of a, a downturn. Now it's highly likely Melbourne and Sydney will be excellent long-term investments because those cities continue to grow and they continue to become more affluent. And I'll talk a bit more about that with some demographic projections in a minute. Um, interesting to have a look at this, this um, property clock. So it comes from Heron Todd White, who are the biggest national uh, property valuers, so they have their finger on the pulse, and they've been doing this for a long time, where they assess where each city is on the property clock. And for those of you that haven't seen the property clock, um, it's it just is a, a a model of where different markets are at. As markets peak at, at, at twelve o'clock, they start to decline. Declining market at three o'clock, uh, they get to the bottom of the market at six o'clock, and then they start their recovery at seven. Uh, rising market at nine, approach the peak at 10. Now it's not a uniform, each of those isn't one year. If the cycle was 12 years, sometimes markets can sit at the bottom of the market for a decade. The Sunshine Coast peaked in about 2003, didn't move much, actually went down and stayed down for about 10 years, depending on the exact areas. So markets can stay in that bottom sector for a long time, and that rise can happen very quickly sometimes over three to five years. We saw that in Sydney, with Sydney being flat for, for five years, of six years from about 2006 to 12, and then jumping rapidly. And Heron Todd White has Sydney and Melbourne um, as declining markets. Um, it'll be interesting to see when they say they think they've hit the bottom. They've had Perth and Darwin at the bottom for a while. Um, and once again, yeah, they will show signs of life eventually and start recovering. Interesting enough, Sunshine Coast and Brisbane showing as approaching a peak once again. You never t can tell. M markets can go way over where they should. So that last leg of the peak can be quite lucrative. Um, and, and certainly, yeah, we're trying to, we're, we are buying property. We're obviously trying to avoid buying too close to a peak. But well selected property, as per well selected shares, will do well over the long run for those where property is part of your strategy, particularly for our younger clients who are, who are growing their wealth. Um, you just got to look harder at the moment to buy properties that are likely to get a decent return in the short term. It's highly probable Sydney and Melbourne will have no real growth for the next five years, maybe longer. Um, but no one can tell you for sure. 
one of the things that drive property prices is demographics. And have a look at this chart from KPMG and Bernard Salt in particular that shows um, population growth since 1954. Firstly to 2015, which is the closest sort of census when this chart was done. I can't remember, it's probably about two years old when I got this, but it's quite useful. Uh, but look at the growth of Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, Brisbane, etc., and the growth rate over that period of time, that 35 year period, you know, Perth more than doubling in size. So yeah, that, that bodes well for those property markets in the, in the coming um, yeah, 30 years. It's interesting, if you add Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast, Brisbane, Ipswich and Toowoomba, you, you get nearly six and a half million people. So that's southeast Queensland. It's going to be a power area and quality properties, waterfront views, etc. They're going to be similar, I suspect, to um, Sydney and Melbourne key areas that have grown strongly over the years as their populations have risen as well. So long term property will do fine as long as the economy is growing, as long as the population is growing, which it's likely to in Australia. But it may slow. We may get slower population growth depending on um, populous um, you know, politics and things that go on there. So um, interesting to watch. So let's put that into perspective. So what does all that mean for you? Well, the current conditions are pretty tepid, slow growth, um, yeah, steady as she goes for your portfolios, no real changes, no need to panic, no need to be alarmed and stick with the plan. The portfolios are delivering results that are consistent with the plans. Um, it's a good time to be either buying or selling for those that need to buy or sell um, to do things. It's, it's an okay time for both. As we said, most of those market conditions are in the fair level. It's not necessarily the best time to buy or the best time to sell. One of the best times to sell is when markets get expensive and you, some of you will have seen that when we're rebalancing your portfolios and topping up your reserves. We prefer to do that when markets are up at that expensive level. And the same is when we're buying, you know, we often would like to buy uh, or top up the um, growth investments when markets are, are down a little. And we can't predict that, but all we can do is wait for it when we're doing that. And you'll see that come through in your reviews. These are not big swings, they're just tiny little little adjustments of the sales to keep you on track. And once again, continue to review as always. Let's have a look at um, one of the main behavior dangers, which is people over trading and hold and yeah, reacting to market events. Um, the Dalbar study in the US, which some of you may have heard me talk about, shows that the return that investors get is much different to the returns that their investments get. So this chart shows from 2000 to 2014, the green bars, the return from the S&P 500, which is the equivalent, say, of the All Ordinaries Index in the US, versus the returns that average investors got in mutual funds. Now, the reason they got less than half the returns is because they don't stick with their strategy. The average holding period of a, of a fund in the US is about three to three and a half years, depending on the timing. So people get out at the wrong time and they get in at the wrong time and they react to events rather than sitting and holding uh, their investments. And we've just seen a perfect illustration of this. This figure is from a JP Morgan report that I get regularly and it shows the monthly flows in and out of mutual funds in the pink and ETFs in the blue. Now it's interesting, ETF are still increasing their share and we, we love ETFs, they're low cost ways of getting exposure to the indexes without excessive costs and without trying to pick expensive managers who we're gonna always have trouble finding good ones. But look at the outflows in December um, out of mutual funds. So right as the market bottomed, people were pulling their money out quite crazy, but we see this in every cycle. People do exactly the wrong thing when they don't have the right perspective, the right advice, the right portfolio. And that's what costs them that gap between the green line and the blue line. So very important as always to avoid reacting to markets rather than having a long-term plan, which you all have. So another lesson from history and this one, this really colorful chart, um, I can't remember, I think it came from Vanguard, um, Vanguard website. And this is based on about 17 years worth of returns, but it shows 14 years worth there. And it shows the average return for different assets, which are sort of consistent with what I was talking about in those markets. But it shows how there is absolutely no rhyme or reason about the order that those returns come in for each market. So you can see uh, international shares, sorry, international property, 
uh, which is the brown, was number one in 2004, but it's all over the place elsewhere. You can see Aussie shares in the blue. Um, yeah, and we go back to 2004, and this was in the lead up to GFC that I talked about, 27%. 21%, 25%, 18%. They were pretty good returns. It's no wonder we then went, oops, minus 40 before we recovered, 39%. Now that's not a full recovery. When markets go down 50%, they need to go up 100% to get back to where they were, but it was still a good recovery. And then 3%, minus 11, 18, 19, 5, 3.8, 11.6, 12.5, and minus 3.5 in 2018 when they did this to the end of December. January and February has already brought us up again, so it's looking like a good year for this year, but it's completely unpredictable. And the lesson from here is why it's so important to be diversified and to hold all of these assets. Um, yeah, so you benefit from all of them at different times. It lowers the volatility and the less volatile your portfolio is, the less likely you are to make mistakes of reacting to markets. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, in upcoming um, episodes of On Track, I'll go through other lessons from history and also other behavior dangers that are relevant to the current market conditions. So all of this reinforces our process, and this is our last slide that I'll leave you with. But ultimately, it's always about having strong goals about the income you need in retirement, the, the legacy you want to leave. Um, yeah, and for those of you building wealth, it's about the goals of how much you're going to need for retirement. Portfolio is designed to meet those goals. So long-term um, growth levels to suit your risk profile, a long-term view, massive diversification. Diversification is one of those, those ways we prevent people from losing money. Um, Low-cost index-based approach, which helps us get the market returns. It's interestingly, the care portfolios, the core portfolios, which are predominantly indexed for the growth side of the portfolios, have been consistently in the top quartile compared to their peers and often in the top 10%, even though we're, we're very much index-based for most of that. So you would expect index-based to be just above average most of the time after allowing for their lower costs, but in fact they, they tend to be well above average because the active managers make more mistakes because they're reactive. And over time it's very hard to pick an active manager. I'll talk more about that in another episode. But yeah, ultimately it's protecting um, against short-term volatility by having reserves for retirees and dollar cost averaging for those still building their portfolio. And rebalance regularly, both rebalancing within the portfolios, which we do at a care investment committee level inside your portfolios, and which um, we do between your portfolios when we sit down with you to either top up your reserves and keep enough money in those reserves so that you never have to sell during one of the downturns that are inevitable, um, that we'll always get. So I hope you got something out of that. Please feel free to, to drop us a line with some feedback. You can comment depending on where you're watching this um, below. Um, but feel free to send us questions, suggestions, and we can adapt this to suit uh, your needs and to keep you informed, up to date, and above all, on track. Thank you for paying attention. And I'll look forward to seeing you soon at your next review.